Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on which part of the world you are joining in. My name is Jaap Verwey. I'm the Managing Director of the Cancer Drug Development Forum. And on behalf of CDDF, as well as its partner, AAADV, I would like to welcome you to this webinar on the development of novel and targeted agents in precision cancer prevention and interception. That will be given by Brian Chawala, but he will be introduced by my fellow uh, chairperson, uh, Professor Kim Lyley. Now, just a few words on the Cancer Drug Development Forum. The Cancer Drug Development Forum is a non-profit organization that is registered in Belgium and provides a neutral platform to stimulate the interaction and particularly the discussion between all stakeholders involved in cancer drug development. So not only pharmaceutical industry, but also academia, regulatory agencies, uh, patient advocacy, obviously, and the health technology assessment regulators that are particularly important for us in Europe. Uh, we try to stimulate discussion and our ultimate aim is to accelerate the development of good drugs for the treatment of cancer. If we go to the next slide, <clears throat> just a few technical aspects related to this webinar. If you have any technical issues uh, in listening in, then please uh, transmit those via the chat function of the Zoom, which is in the bottom side of your screen. Um, don't use the chat function for questions. Questions can be asked by at any time to the speaker, uh, even while the uh, webinar uh, speaker is ongoing, by using the Q&A function, which is also in the bottom side of your screen. Uh, we will read those questions uh, when they come in, and we will make sure that they are referred to the speaker to get an answer. Um, the two moderators will do so. Uh, Dr. Chawla has the only task at the end to answer you all of your questions. And if you want to have a better uh, visibility, visualty, then you can double click either on the Zoom screen or the uh, exit uh, full, uh, to enter and or exit the full screen mode. So if you want to enter, double click and your screen will get larger and you'll have a better view. Um, that leads me to the uh, introduction next uh, of my co-moderator, uh, Professor Kim Lyerly, who is the chair of the AAADV organization. And he will introduce his organization as well as the upcoming meeting for which this webinar serves as a kind of appetizer. And he will also introduce the speaker. Kim, please go ahead. Thank you, Yap. Again, welcome to uh, all of those who are joining uh, on this webinar uh, today. Uh, the AAADV has been um, working in a pre-competitive space to support the development of anti-cancer agents for nearly 20 years. Uh, since the COVID pandemic, we've gone to a virtual format, and we've also tried to take advantage of the ability to be virtual to imagine the global drug development trajectory uh, required for most innovative products today. We continue along that theme by thinking about the global drug development, but this year we thought that uh, an important aspect that perhaps was missing from the usual slate of um, exciting developments was the per perspective of cancer prevention. And this is clearly uh, an, an active area of uh, academic research due to the fact that our understanding of the origins of cancer and, and our ability to detect the genomic changes in these early events is increasing, uh, particularly with the advent of the liquid biopsy uh, and the multi-cancer tests that are being developed. Clearly the need for cancer prevention for, for known um, initiators of, of cancer uh, uh, is important as we've seen the impact of the HPV vaccine, uh, not only in the Western uh, communities, but in low and middle income uh, countries. We think that there are incredibly exciting opportunities for the prevention of cancer um, in the future, and these will impact not only the, the Western economies, but the, those economies that are emerging to have the cancer burden uh, afforded by their uh, middle class and, and uh, population uh, aging uh, dynamics that uh, are predictable uh, in their occurrence in the next uh, few decades. 
So with that, with that in mind, we're delighted to be able to present uh, this webinar, which is a sort of a um, uh, appetizer, if you will, of the, the, the program we have in the fall. And we're delighted to have Brian uh, Cholwa, who was a senior toxicologist and a program director uh, with the uh, chemo prevention branch at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, he's particularly well qualified uh, for this talk because he's not only served at the NCI, uh, involved in a number of uh, important uh, scientific activities, but he's also served as a reviewer at the Food and Drug Administration and has a unique perspective of the opportunities and challenges of uh, developing cancer uh, prevention uh, agents. So with that, we're delighted to to have uh, Brian uh, present uh, his talk and again, participate in the live uh, question and answer uh, period after. Brian. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at uh, currently. Uh, I am Brian Chalawa. I am a senior toxicologist in the Division of Cancer Prevention in the US National Cancer Institute. And today I'm going to talk about the development of novel and targeted agents and pre precision cancer and prevention. So just the typical disclaimers, um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. My The opinions I, I express are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Cancer Institute. And the topics of discussion today are informal and do not represent specific funding opportunities. Uh, so here is a brief overview of uh, the talk that I'm going to give today. I am going to cover prevention and interception, some clinical challenges associated with that, the non-clinical challenges. Um, I will discuss two of our programs, Prevent and CPCTNet, which are primarily where I work, and then I will move into an open discussion. This will all be about a 40,000 foot overview. Um, from my understanding, this is meant to be a precursor to our triple ADV uh, program where we are going to have more in-depth uh, more in-depth discussion about uh, the different aspects of prevention and um, we'll move on from there. So these next few slides I borrowed from uh, our director, Dr. Phil Castle, uh, and I really like to start with this one because I think it demonstrates uh, how we are currently approaching cancer prevention. So typically I, I, I think, over in the left here, um, in the first degree prevention is what most people are uh, consider the prevention space. So prophylaxis, things such as NSAIDs, um, HPV vaccinations, healthy lifestyle, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that we're really focusing on within the division now are the secondary and um, third degree prevention stages. So interception and mitigation. So the interception, once we identify these neoplasias, how do we treat them? And also identifying high-risk cohorts with, uh, in this interception stage. And then going on into mitigation, uh, here we're looking at early detection of asymptomatic cancers, uh, treatments of low-grade cancers such as low Gleason score prostate cancers. And then we have numerous programs uh, working on anti-cancer vaccines. So with these different areas in mind, uh, this brings us to the who, what, how, and where of precision cancer prevention. So this is a publication by, again, Dr. Castle. Um, and this discussed the population risk, the biological risks, the modality, and deliveries that are associated with this. Um, so the who, the population risk, and, and how do we identify these at-risk co cohorts? And so what are the biological and non-biological risk factors? Um, the what, when it comes to biological risk, uh, here we have our biologic and targeted intervention. So this comes back down to uh, the vaccines that I just mentioned. So targeting neoantigens and tumor associated, associated antigens and, and using that approach to uh, um, target these uh, neoplasias and cancers. And then how mode of delivery. So here is just one example of topical versus oral tamoxifen. So one of our approaches to uh, reduce the toxicities that are typically associated with long-term tamoxifen are to do a topical approach. Uh, so really this local approach um, that has the potential to reduce systemic toxicities. And then moving forward um, into the where is really about accessibility. Something that we focus on a lot is 
how are we going to bring these uh, uh, treatments and, and advancements into the community and beyond just uh, academic institutions? And so this slide just represents our internal preventive agent R&D pipeline. So moving from left to right, uh, we have the Moonshot net, uh, program within the US here. So uh, part of that, the Immuno-Oncology Translation Network. Um, and then some of our early discovery programs, uh, CAPIT, which is our uh, uh, prevention and interception uh, agent development, uh, and two new RFAs that have recently been issue, issued is through natural products and our immunoprevention network. Um, and, and so these are really meant to be our novel agent discovery programs that hopefully we can move into prevent. Uh, again, it's a primary focus of mine working through the prevent and CPCT net. And th this is where we take those early stage uh, agents and we try to move them into an advanced preclinical stage and then on into the clinical network. Um, so the CPCT net being our cancer prevention clinical trials network, and then into NCORE, uh, which is our community oncology research program. So this goes from bench to bedside, from uh, prevent to CPC net in phase one, phase two into NCORE, which is our phase two and beyond. And this is a cartoon of the Early Detection Research Network, which I'm not uh, directly associated with, but I think it's critically important uh, in all phases of agent development. Um, so this is the biomarker program uh, conducted within DCP. And as you can see here, uh, it goes, well, I see that part of this is missing, um, but the uh, it goes from discovery to assay development to validation which leads back into discovery. And so th this is a key component into how we can identify these at-risk cohorts uh, through these biomarkers. And then moving on, I think this also plays a critical role in late stage development and clinical trials as far as the potential to identify uh, surrogate endpoints. And so just to demonstrate some of the great work that the EDRN has done, these are eight approved uh, tests that have come through the EDRN. I won't go through all of them. They're available on the website. Um, but as you can see, uh, they have assays such as a non-invasive five-minute office-based procedure to identify Barrett's esophagus, um, genetic mutations associated with pancreatic and ovarian cancer, and the list continues from there. And so what are some of our clinical challenges? Um, so Associated with the, the biomarkers, I, I think that really comes back down to the who and how of precision cancer prevention. So identifying these high-risk cohorts, there are ones that were are, you know, well-established and we're very well aware of, such as Barrett's esophagus, HPV, Lynch syndrome. Uh, we also have numerous molecular signatures that uh, are associated with these malignant transformations, but there's a lot of work to be done here um, to really advance the field to identify these at-risk populations across the broad spectrum of neoplasias and dysplasias. And then uh, going back to those biomarkers, this really comes down to available interim endpoints. So when we consider molecular surrogates, uh, this becomes crucial in the prevention setting because these clinical trials can take an absorbently long time uh, to conduct, which I'll talk a little bit about on the next slide. So having these molecular signatures uh, potentially offer us an interim endpoint uh, that we can evaluate the efficacy of agents prior to the primary endpoint. And then of course we have uh, the toxicities associated with these agents and um, so these are going into healthy populations. They may be at-risk populations, but they are in general just healthy individuals uh, with, with no clinical signs. And in addition to just the physiological toxicity, toxicities that may be associated with these agents, there's other considerations such as financial toxicities and psychological toxicities. So uh, on the financial toxicity side, these agents are gonna be delivered for a long time. So, uh, are we able to provide the agents? Are, is insurance going to cover the agents, which may not be a concern for our European audience, um, but it is a big uh, concern for us in the United States. And then um, there's other associated factors such as trips to the hospital, et cetera. And then there's also psychological um, toxicities that we need to be aware of as we're developing these assays and um, uh, agents such as uh, overdiagnosis, false positives, overtreatment, um, 
you know, what's the balance between uh, uh, sensitivity and these assays and, and causing undue uh, medical treatment. And so uh, this is from a publication from Asad Umar within our group uh, from 2012. And really, I just bring this up to highlight one of the biggest challenges that we face in the prevention setting when it comes to clinical trials. And that is the length that these trials can take from follow-up periods. So I won't go through the list, but you can see coming from, you know, neoplasias and hyperplasias to these at-risk populations, um, you know, it can take six to 20 years to uh, turn into a fully formed carcinoma. So one issue is we're trying to prove a negatives, um, mainly that the carcinomas are not going to form. And for two, these clinical trials can have anywhere from a 10 to 20 year follow-up, which makes the development very difficult. And so some of the current approaches that we're taking to this are um, window of opportunity studies. So these typically consist of, you know, pre-surgery, pre-surgery, resection, and biopsy. Um, so once the neoplasia, cyst, polyp, et cetera, is um, discovered, we administer the agent. And then following the surgery, resection, or biopsy, uh, we have pre and post uh, tissue samples where we can compare the molecular changes and really understand the activity of the compound uh, within the targeted tissue. Uh, we also focus a lot on surveillance. So this is one of the parts of the EDRN. Um, but additionally, we have multiple programs uh, within our division that focus on advancing imaging techniques uh, so that we can potentially identify uh, some of these um, uh, neoplasias and and um, asymptomatic cancers early on. And then of course, risk mitigation. So we do this through uh, multiple ways. Uh, one is the routes of administration, which I briefly touched on earlier through um, tamoxifen. So delivering locally as opposed to systemically uh, with the idea that this can potentially reduce uh, the systemic toxicities that are associated with some of these agents. And then dose reduction and modification. Tamoxifen is another good example here for dose reduction. Um, Low-dose TAM is an area that has gained a lot of interest in the recent years. And then, of course, uh, dose modification. We look at uh, ways to change the administration schedule, the dosing schedule. So as opposed to daily dosing, can we um, dose once a week or once every three days and overall just to reduce exposure. And again, coming back to reducing the risk um, of toxicities. And so speaking of reducing the risk of toxicities, this brings me into some of our non-clinical challenges. So I borrowed this slide from uh, a lecture that I typically give at universities when I discuss regulatory toxicology. And I really want to focus on the last two bullet points. Uh, so this comes down to what toxicities cannot be identified in these clinical trials. Uh, the first being carcinogenicity. Uh, that's typically because of the long latency period and insensitivity of epidemiological studies. And then long-term toxicities, you know, that are not carcinogenicity. So do we have long-term liver, liver damage or kidney damage or uh, other organ sites? And so we really need to uh, develop solid non-clinical programs to address these concerns because again, these are going, going to be healthy populations that can potentially be on these compounds for 10 to 20 plus years. And so with these non-clinical challenges, um, one of the issues that we have are we use investigal, investigational agents. And these are a lot of these are typically coming from the therapeutic arena. And so in cancer therapeutics, you typically follow an ICHS9 guidance. And then we, when we move into healthy populations, you move into the ICHM3 guidance, and there's numerous differences there. Uh, for one, we have increased, um, there's an inc increased amount of uh, studies that are required. And then for two, you need to establish a no AL or a no observable adverse effect limit. And I, I see here I have MTD, but um, what I meant to put in this slide is HNSTD, which is your highest non-severely toxic dose. And these are two different endpoints in your non-clinical studies, and you only need to establish the HNSTD 
uh, under ICHS-9 with therapeutics, whereas we need to establish a no-AL uh, when we're moving into healthy populations. And so if these non-clinical packages have not established the no-AL, this requires additional studies at lower doses. And then, of course, you know, this comes with a high cost and high risk because, again, going back to these are going to be long-term clinical trials. So we're talking about millions of dollars in agent development uh, when we can be looking at a 10 to 20 year endpoint. And then another issue uh, when it comes to doing these non-clinical packages are funding opportunities. So grant mechanisms often don't reward general toxicology. So there's nothing sexy about doing GLP toxicology studies that are very straightforward. Um, you know, and if everything goes right, um, you're not going to be seeing a lot of effects and, and they just don't typically do well in study sections. So, you know, our grant mechanisms of R01s and R21s typically do not uh, cover this sort of agent development which moves me on into some of the efforts that we have within DCP. Uh, and again, this comes back to our agent discovery pipeline, uh, very similar to the slide I showed earlier, where we have our early discovery, prevent, CPCTNet, and NCOR. And so under the prevent program, we evaluate and confirm preclinical activity. We do dosing, scheduling, and formulation optimization. Uh, we do CGMP manufacturing, GLP toxicology, pharmacology, and we offer IND support. Um, so I'll, I'll go a little bit into that on the, the next slide. And then uh, through the Cancer Prevention Clinical Trials Network, we conduct the phase zero to two clinical trials. And then through, um, depending on the, on the data coming out of those trials, that'll move on into our community oncology uh, research program. And I also serve as the DCP regulatory lead. And so I feel obligated to discuss some of our regulatory pipeline. And so you can see in each stage of uh, development here, we uh, offer agreement support. These come in the forms of material transfer agreements, uh, clinical trial agreements, clinical supply agreements, uh, multiple other forms. And then uh, under the prevent side, we offer regulatory consulting. Uh, we offer this to um, applicants, um, and, and pre-applicants. So if there are questions about um, an agent's developability um, and the ability to move into the prevention space, we're happy to have those discussions. Um, we also do pre-ID submissions. These are typically for our accepted applications. So uh, once we start moving the agent forward, we will meet with the FDA to discuss um, the non-clinical pack packages, the clinical synopsis, et cetera. And then we also offer IND support. So this comes in the form of uh, putting the individual modules together. So whether it's, um, you know, uh, the summaries, the uh, CMC data, the non-clinical and pharmacology data uh, will help uh, build those uh, IND packages for support, whether it's through um, um, for submission, whether it's through our clinical trials network, or we'll just hand that back to you and you can move on with your own clinical trial. Um, we do like to see things move through the pipeline. And if you come into the network, uh, we also offer clinical protocol reviews. We also offer IND support and submission. And then we, we uh, continue with trial support. And this comes in the form of things such as uh, adverse event reporting, um, annual reporting, and then the eventual uh, IND inactiv inactivation. And of course, anything that moves on, um, whether it's through NCOR or another late stage clinical trial, we are happy to provide letter, letters of authorization to our INDs conducted within our program. And so just a little bit about the NCI Prevent Program. These are some of our focus areas. Uh, Again, with the you know advancements in the immunoprevention space, we're really trying to incorporate more of this into our program. Over the recent years, it's become at least fifty percent of our portfolio. Uh, but it, we we also still work with a lot of chemo prevention agents. So you know these include novel agents with novel mechanisms, uh, the standard anti-inflammatory approaches, uh, etc. And then we also do some work with the clinic translatable biomarkers of tumor progression and, and or preventative e efficacy. Uh, however, our biomarker portfolio has been shrinking in recent years as we try to move on to later stage development. And so this is just a cartoon um, graphical representation of those uh, focus areas. So we have the 
three main phases of our program, which are proof of concept, secondary testing, and advanced preclinical development. Uh, here you can see our chemo prevention, immunoprevention, and uh, biomarker uh, applications. And then on the left, we have our typical pipeline. So we receive the applications. These go through an external peer review panel. Um, following that, the applications are scored. We receive the highest applications into our MAC review or our internal review board. And this is mainly just to make sure we don't have overlapping projects and it's feasible for us to conduct the studies. And then we award the contracts and move forward with the project. And also, I should say, uh, when it comes into these three individual phases, uh, you can come in at any point and you can also move through these phases. So if it's a proof of concept, it can move into secondary testing and it, following that, it can move into advanced preclinical development. But by all means, we like to move, we like to accept applications that are just in the advanced stages of preclinical development. And so if you're interested in this program, this is just who and how um, you can apply. And so everybody is eligible to apply. This includes, you know, researchers in academia, government, and industry, nationally or internationally. Um, we have two submission deadlines a year. Uh, they're on the second Mondays of January and July. The applications are all done by email through the PDF format. Our email address is listed there. And then any of the um, details about the submission can be found at our website, which is at the bottom of the slide. And so this slide may be a little bit difficult to read, but I did wanna give an overview of our cancer prevention clinical trials network. So particularly um, you can see some of the infrastructure support we have here. So we have a central IRB document management regulatory support, um, an agent repository, as well as a biospecimen repository. Uh, we also have our DMAC, which is our data management and auditing and coordinating center. Um, so this is done through the University of Wisconsin. Um, so they handle all of our, our, our data and auditing, et cetera. And then our CPC uh, net sites, so our network sites are consistent of our lead academic organizations and then our affiliated organizations. And so I will mention um, what those are in this next slide. So if you're interested in working within our clinical trials network and you're not currently affiliated, um, any investigators interested in conducting a clinical trial uh, with an agent ready for clinical testing can join a lead academic organization to become an affiliated organization. So this is done uh, both nationally and internationally. We currently have uh, clinical trials going on in Austria, Italy, Canada, so numerous international partners. Uh, we also help prepare IMPDs uh, for the for example, for the Austrian site. So that is something else that we have familiarity with. And so our lead organizations are Northwestern University of Arizona, MD Anderson, and the Universities of Mich Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, so by establishing uh, contact with them, you're able to become an affiliated organization and enter into our network. And then if you're not interested in doing the clinical trial yourself, um, any investigators who wish to provide an agent for clinical study can reach out to us and we can see if the agent is appropriate uh, for the, um, the, the, the network and to move forward into um, one of our studies. And so with that, I think we can move into the open discussion period. Um, I just want to thank you for your time and I am. Um, Happy to take questions and hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, uh, for uh, an excellent talk. And uh, I'm sure we're going to get some questions. There are currently no questions yet from the audience. If you have a question, just put it into the Q&A box that is on the bottom side of your screen usually. And we will make sure that we will forward that question to Dr. Cholowa to get an answer. So let me take the privilege then to ask the very first question and I'll try to take a simple one here in a very complex area. I was just curious as a former medical oncologist treating patients, um, you, you mentioned tamoxifen and you mentioned topical uh, application of tamoxifen. Now for me, the breast is a, an organ which is not really approachable for topical administration. At least it's, it sounds like if you put an ointment on there, where do you put it? So what is meant here by topical tamoxifen? Um, so 
That's exactly what we do. Um, so it's a um, four hydroxy tamoxifen gel and and it is administered. And it's actually something, um, so <clears throat> this study was uh, led by Brandy Hecken Stoddard. Um, and, you know, that that is one of the considerations is, um, you, you know, outside of just the local versus systemic toxicities, but doing topical applications. And so it's a non-starter if it's going to be, for example, sticky, right? Um, so, um, so one of the things that she brings up is that, you know, women are just not going to put on something sticky on their breasts and then put on clothing and everything else. But um, so a lot goes into the formulation development uh, when, when it comes to these topical applications for, for example, the 4-hydroxytamoxifen. Um, but we did come up with the gel-based, um, you know, it is it's not sticky it it does not form any sort of residue or anything else and and yeah the idea and, and so it is topically applied to the breast itself okay thanks Kim there's a, a question from the audience if you can pick that up thanks Jeff. Uh, again this is a, a question it says um uh Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, if I miss this, but I thought you had not mentioned the BRCA positive patients. Are there any new agents in development to prevent breast cancer in the BRCA positive females? Uh, <clears throat> so I, I did not bring up the BRCA um, positive individuals specifically. Um, it, it, we, we're well aware that it's a high risk cohort. There are a lot of agents in development. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't think I have anything to speak on for, um, any exciting, <laughs> exciting new developments there. Um, it, it is of course, a, a focus of research though. Yeah. I do think that the, uh, the national cancer too, maybe through CTEP is doing a rank, uh, ligand inhibitor for BRCA positive patients. So that, uh, I don't know if you, um, uh, want to comment about that, that's, uh, the, the Nosumab, uh, uh, therapy for the BRCA carriers. Right. I, I, I am aware of the, the rank ligand. Um, I do not have any association with that project, but um, yeah, I, th that is <laughs> something that is occurring within the NCI. And I, all of this is also linked to treatment adherence because this is going to be treatment that's going to be necessary for quite a lengthy point of time. Uh, you already mentioned it could take 20 years up to the occurrence of the actual tumor and uh, treatment adherence is already something in patients that have active cancer. How can we ensure treatment adherence uh, of anything topical, uh, a tamoxifen or an, an, an oral drug or something, if you have to take that drug for 20 years or even more? Right. And I, I mean, I think that comes back down to, you know, really the challenges that we face in the prevention space is that these are long-term treatments. Um, so you have treatment adherence, um, and any toxicities associated with it. So, um, you know, a particularly common one is just GI toxicities. Uh, so uh, we see this even with some of the NSAIDs, such as like naproxen, um, where individuals have GI toxicities. And if they're going to be taking it regularly, it, you're not going to have that treatment adherence. Um, right. There's, there's a question in the, actually in the chat box. So uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. But it also relates to... Uh, not adherence at all, but it says, is there attention given to the burden slash time for the patients that are tested, the population, during the future prevention approaches? So well, how, how do we deal with potential future patients that are already thinking, well, I might get cancer because I have a certain marker that is um, pointing in the wrong direction? Right. Is, that, is that included in the program that you're running at the NCI? Is there psychological uh, support, stuff like that? There are. So um, it, it is not something that I uh, included in this presentation, but so Phil Castle, since he joined um, several years ago, has had a big focus on that. Um, so really um, looking at the uh, management of of these, the, the management of I don't know how to put this. Um, so yes, we 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 are looking at that. Um, it, it's it, it's looking at the the management of the psychological toxicities that are associated with being identified as a high risk cohort. Um, uh, and so 
how, how do we mitigate that? There's a lot of effort going into that. It's it's a new program within our division. It's something that we're considering though. Um, and, and there's been there's been a lot of focus uh, going into that area. Uh, I guess they're making use also of the experience that has been obtained in families with BRCA positivity. Uh, right, yeah. And, and so um, it, it's, it's management of symptoms, um, things of that area is something that uh, Phil has, and, and not just, you know, um, physiological, manifestations of uh, of these symptoms but the psychological aspects as well and so uh, it, it is a new program within the division I, I do believe we're going to have RFAs coming out um, you know going into that that area where it's more of a focus on the psychological aspects and so um, there will be I believe funding opportunities there and, and trying to advance that um, field forward. Thanks. Kim, if you could take the next one, there's questions now coming in at the Q&A box. Yeah, and it's nice to, to see them. So, so Brian, uh, now you're getting the deluge of uh, questions. And, you know, really, I think uh, there are uh, two big ones now, which are, um, you know, if you if you are imagining a cancer prevention trial and particularly uh, looking for the endpoint to preventing cancer, but also potential toxicities, are there are there guidelines or general uh guidance about the long-term follow-up uh, for a, a typical cancer prevention trial or do you have uh, do you have thoughts or is that an area that uh, really um, we should collectively try to develop some standards for so 100 percent we should collectively try to develop some standards for um currently you know we we follow ICH m3 guidelines when we're developing the non-clinical package um and, and so really that's the, um, for indications that are um, generally considered a healthy population. So non-cancer and non-life-threatening or uh, severely uh, disabling. Um, one of the things that is happening within our division is we're trying to work with the FDA. So, you know, our US regulatory agencies and um, one, one of the individuals there, Danielle Kroll, who is a uh, breast oncologist uh, reviewer within the FDA, She's really trying to carve out, you know, some of um, a, a space for prevention itself so that we're not going into, um, you know, the individual reviewing divisions and, and we really have a centralized um, area of regulatory, uh, of the regulatory agency where we can discuss these uh, important questions of, you know, what are the guidelines for these cancer prevention uh, studies and, and how to progress these forward and par particularly one of the main reasons for that is because it's very hard to get industry to support. Again, most companies are not looking to go into a 10 or 20 year development program. Um, so can we can we include these interim endpoints as maybe an emergency use authorization or you know some preliminary authorization um, that would really give companies incentives to to work into this prevention space? Well, that, that really is an exciting job. I'm going to follow on because this, the next question was kind of a follow on to that, which is, um, are there, you know, with that in mind, are there any candidate endpoints that look like they uh, would be attractive uh, in a in a prevention uh, product development that uh, would be a likely endpoint that would achieve some type of um, regulatory recognition that in, in your mind's eye, or is there something or a set of candidate uh, endpoints that you think uh, are likely to, to meet that criteria? So um, I, I will say in my mind, I, I, yes. Um, uh, for the regulatory agencies, I, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think they're uh, you know well enough established to meet the sort of risk assessment criteria that's going to go through a, a reviewer. Um, but through the EDRN, we, you know, we're developing these gene signatures uh, molecular changes, and th that that's really the goal is to, um, you know, some of them with uh, uh, KRAS, um, uh, EGFR, we, we, you know, there's new, all of the cancer pathways that we're all very familiar with. Um, we, we can see those changes within our studies when we're doing these window of, of opportunity studies. Um, and so identifying the reduction of, of these uh, um, oncogenes and, the, and these drivers of these malignant transformations, uh, we, we think serves as a good surrogate endpoint, at least within our studies, to show that there is potential efficacy, which gives us reason to move forward into these longer term studies. Um, but as far as using those as interim endpoints for regulatory acceptance, I, I think we're still a, a ways away from that. 
So that, 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 there's another question that partly links to this, this as well. And uh, maybe this is a question that doesn't have an answer. <laughs> But it, it says, uh, in a genetically high-risk population, at what age would you feel uh, you would uh, feel uh, appropriate uh, for a preventional agent to be started? Just thinking of a disease like hereditary renal papillary cancer, we know that 100% of patients that have that exposure, family history, they will get the cancer. It may take 30 to 40 years in that particular case. Should you start after birth? Uh, I mean, this is an almost impossible question to answer, I guess, but... Yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic question uh, <laughs> from a, a high level overview. Um, and, and I don't know that there's a good answer there, right? So um, again, going back to those long-term toxicities and uh, I mean, we know that NSAIDs are relatively safe, but there are associated risks, you know, uh, even if it's even if it's a small percentage risk, we know there's associated risks. So what's the correct time to start those? Um, you know, I think that's for, a lot of individuals to figure out until the science can catch up to <laughs> really understand what the you know risks may be you know for long term use. Yeah, partly related to this, I noticed in uh, you you mentioned the prevent program. I don't know whether you call it the program, yeah. and I saw in that slide that you showed with the uh, needles and uh, the the uh, uh, sweets, but. Um, in the more advanced program, which is still preclinical, pre uh, you seem to have lost biomarker contracts. Uh, yeah. Biomarkers may be very important, particularly in the choice of what age do you start, what age do you stop, when do you stop. Uh, stuff like that is going to be guided, I guess, to, at least to some point, uh, uh, by biomarkers. So there seems to be less biomarker development in the more uh, uh, later stages of development that you're working on. Is that for any particular reason, or is it just just a chance observation? So no, um, <clears throat> right. So the EDRN and other programs are really focusing on the biomarkers, and since we have numerous programs that focus on these, you know, um, assay development for these biomarkers within the prevent program, we're really trying to move towards uh, agents that we could get into the clinic. Um, and, and and as you saw on that slide, as we move forward, we lose applications and agents in general. So, you know, we, we have 50 applications in our proof of concept, but only, you know, um, 20 applications when we get into um, late stage development. And, and really it's because, I mean, as everybody, you and everybody else probably on this call is aware of, um, you know, it's really difficult to move these agents forward. And there's um, a lot of early, uh, uh, rejection of these agents due to talk, especially in the prevention space, going into healthy volunteers. So if we see any associated toxicities, um, you know, it's just not going to be, uh, useful in the prevention space or usable in the prevention space. So, um, late, late, late stage development is a very difficult thing to go through, but when it comes to the biomarkers, those are, um, now being established through other programs within, within DCP. And if we were going to apply a drug for cancer prevention, um, is there any activity ongoing within the program to develop tools, techniques to improve patient adherence? I, I know for a fact that, for instance, the drug, a drug like Gleevec in CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, which turns a, a deadly disease almost into a chronic disease, still patient adherence in that population is uh, not too good, to, to, to say the least. Um, uh, and you would expect patients to take the drug because it's really uh, uh, saving their life. Now, for prevention, it's going to be even more difficult. So you need tools, techniques uh, to support the patient uh, in really ensuring that they take the drug that they need to take. Is there work? Are you working on that in the program? Yes. So there's a lot of work being done there. Um, so it, it's typically led by... Uh, our great staff of nurse consultants, um, and they they do a lot of work when it comes to uh, patient adherence. Uh, you know what are the pitfalls there? Um, you know what are the reasons that they're not staying on the study drug and uh, meeting the adherence criteria, and then you know also um, diversity recruiting. Uh, you know how to how, how do we get these to diverse populations? Um, so there's there's a lot of work when it comes to the clinical trials, the participants. Um, and, and yeah, we have a great team that spends a lot of time focused on that exact area. Good. Can, can you take the next one, which is online? 
Yeah, again, uh, this is a question about long-term follow-up. I did uh, want to mention that uh, this is about the 20-year uh, anniversary of the uh, prostate cancer prevent trial, which was a uh, uh, 18,000 uh, volunteers um, enrolled in a finasteride versus placebo trial that showed a, a positive benefit, a reduction in prostate cancer, but an odd increase in the number of Gleason uh, high-grade tumors in the in the finasteride uh, trial. So I thought that was quite an interesting observation. Obviously, the, the long-term follow-up showed that overall survival in both populations was identical uh, and that was done uh, in in, in um, Thompson, I think, reported that in the New England Journal about 10 years after. But it, it gets to this next question, which is, um, how do we look at uh, the potential toxicities of the of the prevention agent versus other, um, you know, diseases of aging uh, and uh, whether or not uh, we'll be able to di differentiate that uh, in, in these um prevention trials and will it just be a clinical trial design uh, adverse event reporting as usual or are there some um, strategies to uh, address those uh, those adverse events uh, in in the prevention studies that are likely to to be needed uh, <clears throat> so that's a great question as well it's something that we focus a lot on um that for for one, right, it's difficult uh, comorbidities, things of that nature, especially in elderly populations where a lot of this prevention work is being done. Um, but one of the ways that we're addressing that within the division is we have a safety assessment committee, which I'm on. Um, so it includes uh, multiple, it was headed by Gary Delazana um, and then um, uh, Linda Duty, who is part of our regulatory consulting group. Um, through uh, CCS Associates. And so they head up the safety assessment committee. And what we do there is we review all of our trials. Uh, we review all of the adverse events and we, um, we, we follow those moving forward. So if there's any sort of signals, hopefully we catch them. Uh, and, and those go across all of our trials. So every adverse event uh, is presented. Um, we, we typically go over each agent uh, once a year. And uh, we look at all adverse events that have been reported through the clinical trial. And so if there's any signals there that are consistent across multiple patients or across multiple trials, we we, we try to pick those up. And then, you know, we report those as, as required. You mentioned, Brian, that um, because of the difficulty of the length of time that a, a full study would take uh, to get an answer, you're using window of opportunity studies as well. Usually these have different endpoints as compared to the final study. And how do you, is there any thought uh, already on how to move from the endpoint from the window of opportunity study to the endpoint of the definitive study? It, right, so we use the window of opportunity studies to to really promote the, to assess whether or not the agent can move forward into, you know, these full-blown studies, which tend to be much more costly, have a much longer follow-up. So, um, you know, it, of course, sometimes you do see reductions in, you know, the growth or um, the advancement of these cancers. Um, but otherwise, we look for these molecular signatures. So are we inhibiting, inhibiting the intended pathway within these uh, tissue samples? of whatever the target organ is. If we are, then that's a strong candidate to move forward. Uh, it, and, you know, uh, again, when it comes to clinical trials, it's it's never straightforward. So a lot of times we don't see what we, you know, the hypothesis uh, uh, was for when it comes to the, to the primary end, of, end point of these shorter studies, these window of, window of opportunity studies. Um, and, and so then that's where the agent generally stops uh, when, it, when it comes to the longer term clinical trials. But um, yeah, so it really just allows us to have the assessment for, give us a reason to move forward into the long-term follow-up studies. Um, you mentioned financial constraints, toxicities as well, uh, and of course, that's that's an important element as well. Uh, just thinking of, for instance, BRCA, BRCA expo exposure, I mean, th th if you have BRCA positivity, I think it's 60 to 80% chance of, of developing a cancer, which means still 20 to 40% that the patient or the subject will not get any cancer at all. And how can we balance that uh, out in 
who we should treat and who we should not treat on, or how we decide to stop a treatment or whatever. But also importantly, how is that going to affect the financial consequences there? Because it may be, if you're a devil's, a devil's advocate, you're treating 40% of the population you're treating for no good reason because they will never develop cancer. Uh, I can I can hear the HTA regulators already bringing up that, that issue. And I guess that's a, a good thing to bring up. How can we do with that? Right. And and so this actually came up in a in a uh, meeting that we had last week with our advisory board is how, how do we address that? And um, the the consensus was, you know, it, it varies from area to area. And it, it's a very it, it's a very difficult thing. We there there is no consensus how to do this. So, you know, within the US, if you look on the West Coast, it tends to be, you know, more extreme um uh procedures with double mastectomies things of that nature to prevent uh uh future growth whereas you look on the east coast and and particularly new england um in the northeast with new york and and the coastal areas um it just tends to be treatment with uh you know prophylactic treatment with with drugs or surveillance um so it varies i mean within the us it varies there's a, there's an incredible variation from the east coast to the west coast on how to treat these patients and there's no consensus amongst the oncologists uh, nationwide on how to do that uh, so there's also that balance between uh should we focus on treatment of patients that might get the cancer or early detection by improved imaging techniques um, so, right, right and i mean i am I'm a big proponent of early detection understanding, but again, uh, I, I mentioned that with the uh, psychological toxicities, and I, I think it was Olia Finn that um, a part of our advisory board that brought up a great, a great point uh, is, you know, what are we going to do um, when we start detecting these? Uh, you know, is it going to lead to overtreatment? Is it going to lead, um, you know, to unnecessary uh, medical uh, appointments and, and that relates back to the financial toxicities you know are we bringing patients in to the hospital for no reason um how often are the follow-ups things of that nature so I, I think it's a very fine balance um you know it, it's a very fine balance between having the sensitivity to detect these things and then you know without a treatment in place how do we move forward from there? I, I think that's a, a broader discussion that we need to continue to have. And, and hopefully that's something that comes up in, you know, triple ADV um, and we, we get everybody engaged. In this. I mean, hopefully that's the point of this is to get everybody engaged in those types of discussions. What's the best way to move these forward? But is there any activity in the program to uh, support the development of new technology for imaging that does not involve radiology or uh, radio pharmacos? Absolutely. Um, so we we do have uh, within the program, um, you know, advanced imaging. Trying to look at they're they're actually able to pick up. Um, I, I think it's through mitochondrial activity, and it's associated with the uh, uh, um, sort of the aggressiveness of these neoplasias and how quickly they're uh, replicating or. Um, you know, going through the the cell cycle progression, and right. So, so we're incorporating these really advanced. Um, it, it's supposed to be you know ten thousand uh, times more sensitive than our current imaging, um, and, and so we we do have these programs um, advancing imaging, and I think it's I, I think it's a key component of what we do. Kim, can you take the next one? Yeah, there, there are a couple more questions. So I want to make sure we have uh, we have time to address them in the last uh, few minutes here. What one is. Um, one is a kind of a technical question, which is the predictive value of the preclinical models. Uh, again, if you're if your uh, agents are hitting their target in in a preclinical model, are you getting validation of that uh, in a PK or PD study, a proof of concept, uh, early uh, clinical uh, trial? Uh, and then the, the second question, just to, to think about, is the um, you know is the future of cancer prevention? Um, going to be the NCI or other uh, not-for-profits or will there be a or do you can you imagine a framework of uh, incentives uh, that would uh, address this long lag period and the uncertainty uh, and the development of uh, prevention agents uh, for cancer uh, so to address the first question um, when it comes to preclinical models uh, we typically within our programs assess multiple models 
uh, to verify the preclinical activity. Uh, so typically, you know, we'll use, um, well, there, there, there's two routes. So one, the carcinogen induced uh, models, um, uh, depending on the, the cancer that we're considering. And then we are also using gem models. So the genetically engineered mouse models. Uh, and we, we try to utilize multiple models to show preclinical efficacy. If somebody comes into our program with uh, you know, a one model, we tech, we uh, typically do secondary testing in a different model to make sure that there's preclinical efficacy, and then we'll move it into our advanced um, uh, uh, preclinical stages, which include the GLP toxicology, and of course, those are in um, non-disease models. Uh, the second question was about, uh, can you remind me of the yeah, do do we can we imagine a, a framework of incentives or other um, strategies to provide, um, you know, enthusiasm from the from the pharma industry to address and tackle such a challenging problem, which would obviously be an enormous benefit to to society, but the pathway to that uh, may not uh, be as uh, straightforward as the current therapeutic development pathway. So I, I think that's a fantastic point, and um, which is why I'm appreciative of you having, you know, uh, the prevention talk in uh, AAADD, because I think this is where we will really engage some of the regulators um, and stakeholders into these types of discussions, and and how do we how do we garner interest in the pharma industry because these are high risk, um, high cost uh, studies. And can we have these preliminary endpoints, these surrogate uh, endpoints that, you know, uh, promote agent development um, so that we're not looking at 10 year studies, but is there something within a year or two that may establish, you know, a regulatory path forward? And I, I think a lot of that comes with engaging the regulatory agencies. Uh, there is work being done there, uh, again, through um, somebody who's rotating through our prevention division right now, Daniel Kroll. Um, she's, you know, really working on setting up this space, but I, I think as the prevention space grows and, and we have, um, you know, a, a centric division or uh, a centric um, group of people that we're able to discuss, we can really move things forward in that, in that area. But uh, of course, it, it's much more difficult than the therapeutic space. Well, one, one of the things we want to at least recognize is that the cancer moonshot from the Biden White House is to is something that may also incorporate um, prevention and whether or not there'll be financial incentives, guaranteed purchases, real policy change that could impact uh, the development of prevention agents. Certainly that might be on the horizon and the hope would be the collective uh, voices of the scientists and, and drug development community advocates, et cetera, would uh, contribute to finding a path forward. A absolutely, and so, um... I'm sure many of you are aware of, but like, so Monica Bertinoli, who uh, is running the NCI, is now up uh, up for the NIH uh, director position. Um, you know, she came through cancer prevention, and it's a big focus of hers as well. So I, I think with her leadership going forward and working with the Biden White House, um, there's there's a lot of opportunity there to grow the the prevention space. She understands the important of, importance of it, and I, I think there will be incentives created. You know. Um, and, and that's really what we need to do. I mean, outside of our individual programs within DCP, we, we need to create the incentives to get pharma on board as well, because again, it's a very difficult space. There's a lot of risk there. Uh, they're the risk avoidant. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that's a, a huge consideration. Great point in time to come to a closure of this webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Brian, for an excellent talk and giving all those answers to those difficult questions. Uh, I hope this is still indeed serving as an appetizer for the uh, uh, upcoming AAADV ESCO CBDF workshop in September. You see the dates over here, September 13 to 15, an online meeting. You can find more information on the AAADV website that's indicated over there. And just a few words on a few uh, other meetings that we have upcoming at CDDF. There will be a live webinar on July 10, uh, given by Dr. Alberto Costa on behalf of the European Parliament and Mark Lawler, who is a member of the board of the CDF, on the Beating Cancer in Europe program that the EU has launched uh, some time ago. We will have a multi-stakeholder workshop in Amsterdam uh, in September 18 and 19 on innovative oncology trial designs. And finally, we will have a workshop in November, if I can get the next slide, Michael. 
uh, on the critical role of biomarkers in delivering drug development related precision. That's going to be in November, on November 13 and 14. If you wish to register or get more information, you can use the QR code that is on the right side of the screen. And we would really appreciate your feedback of this, on this webinar. We always try to improve what we do. Uh, if you take the QR code on the right side and simply fill out a very simple survey form that teaches us where we can improve and we will certainly take notice of everything you put in there. Thank you so much for your attendance. Thank you, Brian, for an excellent talk. Thanks, Kim, for the co-moderation. And I wish you a wonderful evening, morning or um, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thanks on behalf of CDDF.